Hello, Mage fans, and welcome to Mage the Podcast, the podcast that works hard towards ascension so you don't have to. I'm your host, Adam Simpson. I'm joined by Terry Robinson. And Terry, it is good that you are here with me today at the end of all things. At least it was meant to be the end. Some endings don't stick, but before we soak in the finality, Terry, are there any announcements today? Announcement is I am now in possession of a two-point wonder that emits a low-level mind two effect that reminds me that I'm married. That <laughs> that wonder is a wedding ring, and thank you to everyone in the Discord that wished me uh, good luck in receiving my nuptials. And that's that's about it for me. Anything for you? Hey, me too. Congratulations, Terry. That's a big step, and I'm very happy for you. We are going to look today at ascension. No, not the game term, not the concept. We're looking at the book named Ascension, which came out in 2004. And according to my research, it is the only mage book that came out in the year 2004. Clocks in at 223 pages. It is one of the few mage hardback books before the M20 line. There were seven authors coming together to work on this. It is quite a lot of content for us today. Normally, Terry does a great job of giving us a walkthrough, but this book was a lot to put on his plate this week, especially with all the events going on in his life. So uh, I stepped up to the plate. I'm going to help with three chapters today. To start off with the prologue, Terry, what are we looking at here? The prologue is a bit of Kathy Ryan fiction explaining the actions of a group known as the Second Seven. Kathy Ryan wrote a bunch of extended introductions for books, and ultimately they would cut whatever they needed to make it fit. So one of the reasons a lot of the Kathy Ryan introductory fiction was somewhat hard to follow in some cases was clarifying information never actually made it into the final book. The Second Seven was after the March of the Nine the council produced a second cabal, a group of people to go around and do something similar. They fell eventually. And then a modern reincarnation of that group occurred known as the second seven. And we meet a bunch of the members of which it includes David Cho and Amanda, who are trying to distract the house of Helicar. We find out that Vormas is trying to sever all links between earth and causality by taking over the shard or shade realm of entropy. I can never remember which one it is. We learn that Senex has pledged himself to something called the Phoenix, an otherwise undiscussed entity that may or not be the eastern equivalent of stasis. Vormos kills Senex trying to get through the portal to the realm of entropy, and then we later find out that Senex was that portal, and also this tide of the phoenix may be why Senex has been able to safely be in the Umbra for so long without being disembodied. The goal Senex ultimately has is to distract Vormas. Vormas is, is being affected by the Avatar Storm, and whenever Vormas needs to world walk, it is injurious. So they're just really trying to buy time. The gauntlet is thinning, weird things are getting through, and we get these uh, snapshots of kind of what is happening in this fight leading up to the last battle. It is longer than most of them. It is vivid and evocative. I liked it. Did you have any thoughts about that piece of prologue fiction? I've never really been a big fan of the Amanda fiction, but a lot of Mage fans have really enjoyed it. So it's good that they could get a nice healthy dose of it here at the, uh, at the intended end of revised edition. The introduction is known as, is called The Trumpet's Clarion, and it is leading up to the finale and telling you how to use the book. It says, uh, this is the last mage book. Something else will come later. You can keep playing. They're not going to stop you. You can ignore the end fiction for the other World of Darkness lines if you want. But the goal here is to settle old scores, to provide a big outline, and to kind of say, hey, here are some payoffs to plot threads that have been open in some cases for decades. It indicates that Judgment, the first of the scenarios, is the most detailed and is the closest we will get to a canon one. And the other scenarios are a little bit more on the vaguer side. And with that, it, it, it kind of moves on to those individual scenarios, as well as some general advice on how to do this. We also get a letter from Bill Bridges that is basically like, this has been wild. Let's break some stuff. And I'm like, that's my Bill Bridges. It says, quote, White Wolf is ceasing publication of the current mage game and its World of Darkness cousins, end quote. And I was thinking, uh, these days, mage fans snicker about that. There were four more convention books for the Technocracy uh, for the revised edition. But uh, a lot of us forget that for eight years, 
Ascension was the last word in Mage. It was only eight years later that a different group of people came together and said, hey, you know what? There were four convention books that never got finished for a revised edition. Wouldn't it be fun to, to put those together and you know have a, have a sort of last uh, hurrah for uh, revised edition? So, yeah, for eight years, it, it stood as the final note. Uh, page 19, uh, quote, there were some odd ideas that slipped into the first edition that were later quietly ignored, many for good reasons, others because, well, they just didn't fit the direction in which the game was now going, end quote. And uh, yeah, that is, is very, very true. Mage went in a different direction with later second edition, especially with revised edition, so a lot of ideas which were a, very much a part of Mage were not uh, a good fit for the new direction it was taking, and so they got laid by the wayside. And so that, for me, is one of the real uh, joys of being able to go through the early books and see those ideas uh, all together, all in their original context. Uh, made it uh, very worthwhile for me. Also on page 19, quote, Taking up the reins from Phil was Jess Hainick, who gave the game a new spin and a revised edition toning down some of the frankly over-the-top directions the game had occasionally wandered into, end quote. And I disagree it was over-the-top. I liked it when it got big and imaginative and uh, innovative. I, I really enjoyed that big, wide-open setting of the first two editions. So, uh, yeah, not, not everyone agrees that it was over-the-top and needed to be toned down. The first chapter is entitled Sign of the Times, and it kind of gives you an idea of what are the precursors to what's happening, what are the set of signs that will indicate that the end times are upon us, and how will various groups react. It kind of breaks this down into what are the current signs and what are the ones yet to come. So far, we have seen the red star, the sign of the birth of some sort of paragon, at least in Garu cosmology. It's visible to those with rite or awareness, and eventually it is visible to everyone. The risen dead are around. The shamblers of Hunter the Reckoning have escaped, and the imbued pursue them. Eventually, the imbued may fight or look to mages for guidance, and it leaves it open as to how Hunter will respond to encountering the awakened that there have been awakening ancients that the ravnos anti rose and was nuked but they aren't just vampires they caused outbreaks of madness and awakened knowledge in humans that the darkness is out there and more will come and we get the idea that once humans kind of get an idea of the terror that lurks in their own world the power of the consensus will make more of those terrors become present we have the presence of the storm wardens and the psychopomps in Manifesto, we get information about the experiments that the progenitors did to create something that is both of spirit and of flesh, an Anakim that can control the storm. The psychopomps have returned to judge souls. In addition to that, there are new signs that are occur occurring. Plagues and weird happenings will start to occur. Religious visions will likely increase, possibly in some regions, possibly more so among the pious. Prophetic dreams will increase. Players may experience flashes of insight they don't recall. Storytellers are recommended if they need to fill in a past detail that you can tell characters, oh yes, you remember this from a dream. Paradox manifestations will start to conform to uh, dreams of the end times and judgment, where suddenly angels or hobgoblins will pester the vulgar, bringing down some sort of judgment, and that paradigms may start to disappear. As, as paradox manifests, the sinful may be removed, Nefandi may exit to hell, the technocrat may go to the hollow earth, until only one paradigm remains in the time of judgment itself. I thought this was an interesting option. I would have liked a little bit more information on what the disappearance of a paradigm looks like so kind of this interesting uh, millennial view that people of certain persuasions will start disappearing and then they talk about future signs that will like really indicate the things are up and running small events will start various groups are going to start mobilizing masters will discern the nature of the avatar storm is being made of conscious disembodied avatars these shards want to meld with humans and give them power before ascension now strange creatures are able to get through shallowings may begin to grow and spirits that can't normally materialize will gain that ability mortals will view this and witness it through whatever lens of strange phenomenon their worldview allows they could view it as 
aliens. They could view it as religious. This, these events are referred to as incursions. Characters may be asked to investigate one such event, and that can kind of indicate that things are changing. They will eventually get much more specific. Other groups may also be interested, as marauders see this as an opportunity to spread madness, and Nefandi seek to take advantage of the spiritual corruption that can occur if banes start getting through. There may be a point where an invasion begins, where humans gain the ability to talk to spirits. Humans will erupt with powers from avatar shards as they seek a home in the final days. Some can control these shards. They are the psychopomps, and they have existed before. Also, people may be touched through the periphery, the uh, remarkably vague region between mundane reality and the umbra before the gauntlet that we never really get too much information on. These mergers are new and previously the merger of spirit shard and person was kind of a, a willing thing that the psychopomps helped shepherd, but now they are occurring seemingly at random, which can cause corruption in the people receiving those shards. The, the appearance of these shards are going to be paradigm specific. Eventually abductions and awakenings may occur. People will talk of rapture and disappearances and things that protect night folk from dark forces may, may fail. Gates may open into the umbra. Shards will come through and awakenings will increase. The strong-willed are the most likely to receive one of these shards. Mortal cults may form seeking awareness or following of one of these Anakim. Paradox may change as beings walk through the barrier between worlds. Once mortals realize monsters are real, there's really no way to turn back. That, the book suggests, is kind of a tipping point. Uh, mortals may fight worship, but they will not ignore these entities. Uh, the final stage is one of speculation and possibly annihilation. The question is, how will each group react? It then walks through some potential responses from each of the traditions. And some of these I thought were quite interesting. The first they list is the Akashiana may be entirely fine with the end times. They recognize that every glass is only temporarily unbroken and that existence itself is transient, uh, which is a bit more fatalistic than I was necessarily anticipating, but eh, it makes sense. The chorus may see its faith confirmed or crumble as the end times do or don't match up with a particular sect's view of how things should un undergo. The cultists will have a mixed response. Some will descend into hedonism. Some will sidestep time in an attempt to avoid it. Others will seek to understand. Uh, the dream speakers may welcome the destruction of the gauntlet. The euthanatoi are like very suggested as being like, ah, so humanity is going to be judged in its entirety in one fell swoop. Hold my beer. In that they've been preparing for such karmic destiny for, for their entire time. Hollowers may embrace the romance of being in the final days. The order claims that it will be unafraid in the face of wizards being revealed, uh, but they face the problem of needing to understand the final judgment as opposed to win over it. The Society of Ether may be racked by internal divisions as to how to respond to it, and they it will be very difficult for them to mount a unified response. Uh, the Verbena are healers and leaders within communities, and their ability to do so in the end times will be tested. And finally, the virtual adepts, they're just like, and they'll coordinate everything. It's like, yay, <laughs> secretaries of the apocalypse. It also mentions a return of activity for the rogue council, that in phase four, we had a bunch of previous phases of what the rogue council was doing, that transmissions will fade, and then in a phase five, new riddles will appear, and it will specifically not blame technocrats, as a lot of the previous ones did. Uh, and then finally, in a phase six, there will be omens, as the council, the rogue council, gains the strong ability to predict with pinpoint accuracy where awakenings are going to occur. The book mentions that in the end times, the rate of seekings may increase significantly, but that the avatars may start expressing their own agenda, or may be doing so more prominently, that more bad things may pop up after a failed seeking. And they have a sidebar again on kind of rough rules for the consensus, where it's more or less, if you have 100 mortals in one spot, you probably have at least a weak consensus. But once mortals start seeing kooky things, kooky things start becoming more acceptable. Mechanically, this may reflect itself in reduced difficulties in doing vulgar magic, and that Armageddon is kind of the breaking of reality itself. Well, chapter one had a, a number of uh, interesting points uh, mixed in with it. Uh, for example, on page 24, they talked about using hunters, also called the imbued, and the zombies that they fight as part of a uh, apocalypse scenario. And that, that really appeared to me. If I was going to do a, a, a mage game around the end of the world and everything getting torn up, I would definitely pull in hunters and, and the zombies they oppose. I, I think that, 
that fits quite nicely. And there could be some, a few themes of similarity that I see between hunters and mages that I would I'd love to play with. Uh, page 28 had a section called Virulent Paradox. And this was just so thought provoking for me. I was, I, gazed off into space after reading this and was stuck for like a half hour. Uh, it just, I thought it was really great. I was talking about how do mages tell the difference between quiet and ascension. And if they have trouble telling the difference between the two, then that might cause a number of mages to doubt the existence of ascension and think of it more of as, as a polite metaphor or something like that. So if magic is pushing away from reality, then too much of this is quiet. So does this mean ascension is pushing into reality? I, I don't know. I, I don't have solid answers here, but that section was just so thought-provoking for me. I, I really enjoyed that. Um, page 30 talked about how in revised edition, the Avatar Storm weakens the gauntlet, it increases shallowings, basically it allows more weird stuff to get through. And the more weird stuff that gets through, the more regular people see the weird stuff and start believing in the weird stuff. And so over time, not, not like in a week, but over a couple of years, this could lead to a vicious cycle of more and more weird stuff, more and more belief in weird stuff allows more weird stuff to come through. And, you know, on and on. Uh, so I, I thought that was, was interesting. It sort of helps me get a uh, perspective on the Avatar Storm and, and see what it was probably meant for. Uh, page 48 had a very odd quote. A mage's seeking realizes the potential of his avatar, granting him epiphanies into the true workings of magic. Yet a seeking can be far more than an attempt to seize greater magical power, end quote. After reading that, I was thinking, wait, hold hold on, hold on. The author who is telling us about seekings could probably benefit from a little study on the notion of seekings. <laughs> learning more about magic is learning more about the universe. It isn't just seizing power. So that, that struck me as really odd. Um, and towards the end of this chapter, there was the section on how the 10 different traditions, you know, counting the hollow ones, might look at uh, Armageddon, the might, what their reactions might be towards that. I really found this section to be quite vague and, to be honest, not very helpful. It, it seems like it was a, a necessary point on a, a list of things to do for this chapter, and so the author said, well, okay, we've got, got to fill it out with something. I guess we'll put this down. I, I just didn't find it to be all that helpful myself, but uh, hopefully other people were able to get more out of that. Chapter 2 is entitled judgment and boy howdy is this is this a chonker this chapter is presumed to kind of be the most canon ish of the endings with all of the end times lines they gave multiple options for how that given line could end at least for the the big three so in Gehenna we have a whole bunch of scenarios in Apocalypse we have a whole bunch of scenarios and in Ascension we have a whole bunch of scenarios of which generally the first is considered the, the canon one this one involves a lot of secret history and a lot of hidden backstory so I will uh, try and be economical with describing it but it is backstory that retroactively reframes a lot of what has already happened. So in that regard, I think it is interesting. Again, this is not necessarily considered canon unless it is described in another book. For instance, early on in this book, Senex dies, and then in Revised Void Engineer, they're like, oh yeah, Senex is on Pluto doing some kooky shit. Someone should look into that guy. Suggesting that Senex is still alive or that the Void Engineers are misinformed. So uh, just remember, it is hard to use the book Ascension to settle an argument unless you are talking about the book Ascension. It's starts with the idea that the world of darkness is wounded, that it is fundamentally wrong that mortals do not have the ability to properly interface with causality and karma, and that only mages have the ability to touch destiny directly. The Euthanatoi and the uh, Ixoi noted this, uh, the Ixoi being an early Greek group that, uh, dealt with karma and fate and similar things. Beyond the one, the that's the one capital O, there were other entities that had shards to them. One of these created the psychopomps. The psychopomps in the form of, when merged with a human, uh, formed the Anakim who could control souls and helped crush the initial demon overlords of the Fertile Crescent, which we got a, a peak of in dead magic. The knife of Ixion was taken from the demon overlords. Uh, Ixion was a character in uh, Greek myth who was responsible for the first murder, uh, similar to Cain. 
And the Nefandi strongly want this item in that it is humanity's first strike against divine order. Uh, the Ixioi formed a group to deliver judgment on mortals guided by the psychopomps. Uh, it is indicated that the psychopomps were in some way barred from directly interfering with the activity of humans. But apparently telling an assassin to go kill a guy isn't considered interfering. I don't know. I don't write the rules. This is the part where uh, blood kind of shot out my nose. They talk about how the psychopomps were from a future where ascension had been reached and tried to touch back to deliver that upon earlier history, but shattered against the consensus of the time, and the tenth sphere of judgment was lost. That moment of contact was the Night of Fauna, which cr created the Ali Batini uh, during the moment of Intelliki. So that's a sentence. In Lost Paths, we find out that the Ali Batini are created during a particular event where two different groups come together, and in a night of uh, ecstatic dancing this entity kind of reveals itself, the, the Qijad al-Akbar. And it is suggested that that was actually an event that occurred from the future. This event radiates both forward and backward in time, such that for a period of time, the psychopomps are present and avatars and mages unite in perfect union and avatars make no noise. Later on, it mentions during the Dark Ages that magic came from a fount as opposed to from this other kind of voice as it does in modern times. As time passed, the Judge Mystics lost contact with the Psychopomps. Many joined the Technocracy as the Seraphi, while others stayed as part of the Golden, golden Chalice within the Euthanatoi. By the 15th century, all the Psychopomps were barred and only Hillel could contact them. Hillel wanted to clear their name and entrusted their work in contacting the Psychopomps to both their children and Porthos. Porthos never spoke. And False Hillel, the entity that invaded Horizon, was one of the children. The grimoire that Hillel produced, instead of being a literal grimoire, was a astral one. And it reformed whenever their kids got back together again, which is what takes place in the story. Hillel had found an angel name, the true name of an angel or a psychopomp that could bless their union when Hillel formed from two merged avatars. And... That entity could control souls and avatars and stuff. The Caserify were eventually unpleased by what the technocracy did, so they kind of planted a raid against themselves and erased all evidences of their existence and then used the evidence of that raid to join the Order of Hermes as the Janissaries. Later, Chiron Mostai realizes that if the Euthanatoi and Patini are successful, reality will be destroyed, and he tries to stop Ascension. The key insight here is that Ascension and Destruction are the same thing. With that secret history kind of out of the way, we get more information. One is the idea that one immediate effect of being in the end times is that time magic and forecasting starts to break. As the amount of future that is left over drops, the distance into the future that scrying and time two effects will do also starts breaking. As this hap happens, uh, we find out that Vormas is trying to break the wheel, wheel capital W, which is the chain of causality and karma to avoid destruction, karmic justice, and possible dissolution. He has uh, mastered dark nodes, knowing that soul shards exist in anticipation of destroying the wheel and replacing it with himself. And at this point, the story begins. The characters are drawn into the story by one of the characters receiving an infectious dream. One of the characters in your group is going to be the heir of Hillel, and they recommend pick someone with a high destiny and possibly with a storm warden trait. They see a giant figure with a twin star eyes that merge to become the uh, comet Merzaba. And this the whole thing is dense with symbolism. And it's like, hey, if your characters are super smart and use time magic or mind magic or read Latin and they make a roll, here's all the clues they could get. And I'm like, uh, thank you, but no thank you. Um, just give everyone the information. At the same time, they also get a prophecy in the form of a DVD that records a interrogation that has gone south. They capture the technocracy, it captures an entity that is calling itself the Phoenix, and it subdues everyone in the room, talks directly to the camera, and is like, you, receiving this DVD, do these exact things, telling the characters to go to San Francisco and, and visit the Belasco Theater, and you're like, well, okay, that's, that's subtle in terms of plot direction. At some point in the story, your characters and Mark Gillen 
the uh, knight errant from the Order of Hermes that revealed the suppression of information of the Hermetics having knowledge about what the House of Helicar was up to. It, if they come in contact, the grimoire is activated and mental pages kind of rush towards everyone. Hillel predict Porthos' silence and not freeing his name after betraying the first cabal, it, that they need to protect the divine union, and that if people don't do that appropriately, the entire attempt to stop Vormas and to save reality will fail. At this meeting that occurs at the Belasco Theater, um, Alexei Dijin from Jupiter's Forge, which was one of the groups that was introduced in Manifesto Transmissions of the Rogue Cabal, reveals that the tenth seat was found in a chantry in Iraq. The technocrats knew that this meeting was going to happen. They raid a whole bunch of Batini, emerge out of nowhere, and just start strangling technocrats, which is kind of cool. They're like okay, this random thing happened and got you into terrible violence. You need to come with us immediately. So we have this, like, come with me if you want to leave moment. And if they choose to, they, they get whisked off to Turkey, where Chiron Mustai reveals that he engineered the betrayal of the traditions in current times to keep humanity sleeping for as long as possible, to delay ascension, to prevent everyone from dying, that he was responsible for the purge of the Seraphi. And then he gives an information dump before being like, peace, and he crosses the gauntlet to be judged by the Avatar shards. And you're like, well, that... Well, that happened. Ultimately, the characters will need to perform a rote to merge safely with one of the Avatar shards to not die when the gauntlet fails. To do so, you must stand before the Tenth Seat, which contains information on appropriate psychopomps. The idea here is there is this rote called Holy Union that allows you to incorporate an Avatar shard from the Avatar Storm safely, which makes you immune to the effects of it, but also grants you the ability to control the Avatar Storm. To do this safely, though, you need to find the true name of a psychopomp with the appropriate essence and personality so that this merger goes well. If it doesn't, you get something called a corruption trait uh, and become one of the Anunnaki. The first Anunnaki we got was Timothy Wu in the book uh, Manifesto Transmissions from the Rogue Cabal. He was someone who this merger had occurred to. They didn't talk about it ahead of time, uh, and he went all murdery, uh, turning into this angel-alien hybrid thing. Vormas is stomping towards the realm of entropy, going realm by realm in the House of Helicar. He is matched by Senex, whose patron, the Phoenix, says he can either let Vormas pass or purge creation. He chooses to let Vormas pass. Vormas is armed by the Pasapada Astra, which is kind of the ultimate weapon that is uh, wielded by Shiva in this form of this spiritual trident. At some point, the gauntlet between Earth and the High Umbra drops and 10,000 pattern avatars awake. These entities are able to uh, name the psychopomps for other people with pattern avatars. These new mages start with a dot of storm tainted resonance. At this point, shards are now in reality, and you need to dodge them with one of my favorite roles, Dexterity plus Occult. The middle umbra eventually collapses, and again, dynamic shards go through the world. Animals become subtly intelligent, and banes and drones may manifest. Then the Void Engineers just kind of like leave. The technocracy ups the hunt for reality deviants and activates uh, programs set up within governments to warn against tar uh, terrorist groups saying like, ah, they've given everyone the drugs and there's weird weapons. We better set up internment camps. And then the hollowers quickly shut those down. Okay. Some sort of regrouping occurs and then your, sh your cabal should hopefully be in charge. Uh, seven months later, the shroud falls and a maelstrom occurs, which quickly melts. So a strange storm erupts in reality, and now a primordial wave of awakening occurs. Uh, the marauders are waiting with forks and knives at kind of the edge of reality, waiting for the uh, collapse of everything. And the Nefandi wish to destroy Antilios, realizing, oh no, that will kill us too. And we also don't want to be judged. What for the bad things we have done? The technocracy is able to gather considerable forces, but so are the traditions. Australia is strangely protected to, due to the spirits of the sleeping land rising to protect Australia. So it's like kind of suggested that the final showdown will occur on Australia, which is like big, by the way. So it's kind of vague to be like, yes, there will be a showdown in sub-Saharan Africa. You're like, you realize that's several hundred thousand square miles. Yes. As they fend off the technocracy, they receive a message from Tychoides to meet him at the Fortress of Government, and the characters gain the opportunity to see control. He is in the body of a 10-year-old boy, and one potential explanation of what control is is given, that the mutated maximi of the old conventions of the Order of Reason eventually became the original Collegium, and they began to dissolve. 
solve. Control now became the hopes and fears of the technocracy, except for the void engineers who had trained to stop contributing and the iterators for whom the computer blocked this participation in this, this collective uh, unconscious. Tychoides magically has the knife of Ixion. He's like, this seems like a useful thing. And then we, we find the real uh, hero of Ascension, the Grand Via Silicos, which is uh, Adam and I discussed at Technomancer's Toy Box, which is this big sphere that allows you to communicate with people. And the characters are now able to issue commands to the entirety of the technocracy in exchange for a point of permanent willpower each time they do it. If they keep going, they may become dissolved and join control. The marauders are going to attack, which is remarkably vague. In part three, Dante suddenly appears and is like, give me the knife of Ixion. You're like, you're an oracle of correspondence. Can't you just take it? And Dante is like, shut up. Um, and he <laughs> leads him to the to Horizon to meet the Horizon Council, where we find out that the the avatars of great previous mages are are still there, and they're like, there are two remaining threats that we cannot help you with, even though we could clearly help you with it. The threats are the Marauders and Vormas. Vormas plans on destroying the very concept of judgment by harnessing all of the questing avatars to uh, destroy Merzaba or Antelios or whatever you want to call it. It is revealed that the Malfians and the Psychopomps are two sides of the same coin, one representing ascension and the other representing annihilation. By pledging themselves to the Malfians, the Nefandi have given up on judgment and are just annihilation, so that's kind of a uh, poop-in-the-pants moment for them. Vormas wields the Pasupada Ostra stolen from the apex of history after stealing the essence of a, bo of a god. This whole chapter is just wild. I'm just putting that one out there. The outer planets have been torn through by Vormas as he walks from world to world to get to Pluto. To get there needs to more or less do a seeking in each of those shard and or shade realms, and once they get to Pluto they may pass to the realm of entropy. The book is like, yeah, each planet represents a a sphere and Helios is the planet for the 10th sphere of judgment. Once you are characters make it to the entropy realm you need to stop the castle helicar uh, which is this walking fortress there are three ways of doing it killing vormas breaking the flow of quintessence that vormas is using to make everything run and neutralizing the pasupada ostra which can be done by reuniting it with the knife of ixion and then using it to kill someone causing it to turn into a mundane knife if you also find a way to destroy the realm of entropy i suppose that works if you win, if you go through this batshit crazy scenario and you're able to stop Vormas, good luck with that. Uh, congratulations, you have freed humanity and all the remaining shards result in our remaining humans becoming uh, mages. And it's like, and everything's kind of nice because everyone gets exactly what they want, except for the Nafandi who go to their dream hells and the marauders who disappear into quiet. And you're like, Okay, that was a lot of me talking, but there was a lot that happened in there. We'll see how I thin that out in editing. But some of what was written to me was simply unclear where I'm like, what the dink is happening? There were some chapters where they're like, the following earth shattering events all occur within four minutes of each other in these following three sentences. My other criticism is just about everyone involved as a sausage fest. It, like, it's just male characters for days. I'm like, come on, there's got to be like one lady involved in this plot. But otherwise, holy dink, a lot of things happened in here. It's, it's a way to go out with a bang. I, I don't know how one would keep this on rails to be like, to, to have one event lead into the other, especially when suddenly like, oh, Dante appears. You're like, okay. Well, that happened. Adam, what did you think of, uh, quote unquote, the canon ending of Mage the Ascension? It basically was the canon ending. They, they state in the book, uh, quote, this is as close to a canon ending as we're going to get, end quote. That might not be word perfect, but that's what they said. And what they're basically saying is if you want a canon ending, here it is. If you don't want a canon ending, then don't worry about it. It's, it's cool. And I, I can agree with that. I have no argument with that. I was impressed with how well structured uh, this, this story was. This was like, um, I think, if I remember correctly, 45 pages, more than 40 pages. This is the uh, thickest chapter in this book. And there was a lot of lore from past published mage books that were brought into this and i think that's what mage fans wanted I, I think that was entirely appropriate i think it was fairly skillfully done um i was just impressed with how well all of this was structured uh, because when you're running an end of the world scenario you're basically moving towards an inevitable occurrence and then it's like well you know when you're running a role-playing story for people aren't you supposed to have things open-ended so the players can, can change things like well 
an apocalypse story really is different. I mean, the world's got to end or it's not an apocalypse story, and that, that's something that players can't change. But it's kind of like dealing with an earthquake. You can't stop the earthquake, but you can you know, deal with what goes on around it. And for all of the things happening, for all of the elements of past mage lore brought into this, I think this was very well structured. There was direction to it. There are a few points where it feels like we're shoving the players in a certain direction. But uh, compared to the other stories in this book, and, and faced with the material that this chapter has to, to thresh out, I think it was very well done. I think this author had a, a really good sense of, of how to put this together and still leave some options open and, and let the players make some decisions on their own. Well, let's get down to specifics here. I thought it was a bit odd that Vormas was such a pivotal character on such a grand cosmic scale. I know that he was a big part of the meta plot going through the first two editions of the game, and he's mentioned again in Revised Edition. So as many times as he is mentioned, I guess it's appropriate to give him a big role in this. But just from my own point of view, I saw him as a rogue mage who had a little bit of power and authority. So yeah, he was causing problems and he had to be shut down. And I guess the story of tracking him and working against him was pretty interesting. I, I just never saw him as a a cosmic figure, but I've got to say, I I chuckle every time I think of how Revised Edition, being the lowest powered edition of Mage, is the only edition to feature a mage who is so powerful he can break the universe. Just throwing that out there. I, I, I get a chuckle. There was a number of new concepts created for this chapter. For example, the Ixios, I, I think they were invented for this chapter, this story. And I, I thought they were interesting. But there were a number of other things uh, that did not appeal to me quite as much. I mean, one nitpick for me was um, they mentioned the one with the capital O, which was, you know, of course, mentioned several times in, in past mage books. And it talks about how, well, there's this other with a capital O. And it's like, okay, look, if the, if you've got a one and you've got an other, then don't say the one, you say the two. Because when you say the one, the point is there's only one. That That is the point of capitalizing that. But okay, that's a nitpick. That, that's probably not a, a problem for most uh, mage fans out there. But the recasting of Chiron Mustai, he was the biggest villain in mage for, for the Order of Hermes. And to recast him as a, a kind of reluctant savior, I think it was kind of gimmicky. I think it sort of takes the fun out of him. I kind of prefer when he was a, a nasty villain who was out to dominate everything, but um, that was my take on it. One of the things that was hard for me was um, I was I had always been reading in Revised Edition that the Avatar Storm is made up of broken pieces of avatars. And so this chapter makes it clear that each piece can function as a whole avatar and awaken the sleeper. And it's like, okay, I, I thought broken pieces were not whole avatars. I, I thought there was a real difference. But this chapter just says, yeah, there's no difference. You break apart an avatar into 100 pieces and every piece is a fully functioning avatar. Well, then did it break rather than just reproduce? But page 71 gives a description of what it is like when the astral layer of the umbra falls. That is the high umbra ceases to be and, and mer sort of pours in over the whole world. I thought that was, was very interesting. Reading through that description on page 71, I thought that, that, is, that is really cool. And not only are you saying that it's happening, but you're telling us what it might look like, some, what some of the effects of that might be. And I think that would be a lot of fun to, to play with uh, in, in a game if I was running this story. So thumbs up for that one. As I was talking about structure uh, earlier for this chapter, and uh, one of the points of structure is there are a couple of points during the story where it says, okay, there's a few, month br uh, few months break here. So this is kind of, it's not really meant to be downtime, but it kind of looks that way. It's like, okay, there's a pause in events, and your players are given the space to uh, do what they want or try and figure things out on their own. And this is also a place where the storyteller can introduce or wrap up their own uh, character-appropriate uh, side stories or plot elements. And so I, I thought it was very smart to work these couple-of-month breaks in at certain points because if you just... I mean, this story has a lot of earth shattering events one after another. And if, and if you actually run it that way one after another, then it gets to be too much. It can overwhelm your players. They, they'll start cracking jokes and, and thinking it's all a little bit silly. So these breathers are a very good idea. Also, it states uh, fairly early on in the story that the players are given authority 
in two main ways. One is the Ali Batin give them one of their chantries, which the chantry itself has a very high arcane, which means it's not only stealth, but like mystic stealth at the same time. So it's very hard for enemies to find the place. And that explains why not a lot of people knew it was there before, even mages. And uh, this is a very good idea. It not only gives the players a home base, but there are actually resources connected to this chantry that the players can use. Uh, there's also a group of mages who are very good at stealth, very good at combat, and they become basically awakened troops under the command of the players. And again, I think this fits very well. In an end of the world scenario, it's easy for the players to feel like they're overwhelmed. It's like, oh my gosh, all these big important people are doing all these big important things. You can't stop an earthquake. I guess we'll just take a back seat and try to pick up the pieces. It's like, no, no, we are giving you a powerful chantry. We're giving you very capable mage troops. If you decide to exert your authority, you can actually do that. And because you have these things, other mages will look at the player characters and say, oh, you're one of the big wheels here. I guess we ought to talk to you. So again, very well structured for this kind of a story. I thought it was cool how the Dreamborn that is basically umbrewed of, of just the special umbral layer that's existing in Australia, they have a special way of uh, attacking mages. Uh, every quintessence that the mage has becomes a sort of two-point backlash or, or something like that. I, I thought that was a, a unique attack that the Dreamborn can bring to bear against mages. And I always like it when you have a specific location as a part of your story, you do something to make that location unique. This isn't just a place on the map where I'm arbitrarily having an event of the story happen. It's like there's something about this location that makes it interesting enough to bring into my story. And so this special ability of the, the Dreamborn helps make Australia click for me. Uh, let's see, page 81. I like the idea of technocracy's control having a, a unique kind of disembodiment. They sort of fade away, yet at the same time they are a kind of invisible collective spirit that can exert its will but only along certain lines and this is a consequence of the kind of control that the technocracy pursued and the way that they conditioned uh, such a large number of technocracy uh, mages under their authority and so that that was very interesting for me in a way it was kind of appropriate now I, I realize it's not actual mage canon that you enforce on every mage chronicle you're running but I wouldn't mind using this in my own chronicle I thought it was it was an appropriate idea it fit and it was interesting I like the idea of the traditions and the technocracy coming together to cooperate uh, towards the end of this story I think that had a certain appropriateness to it as a, a mage fan who's been reading through all three editions of mage that that clicked for me at the end of all things the wall between these two groups probably ought to drop and they probably ought to say to each other hey this place is a mess maybe we should work work together even if it's just this once and uh, the thing they're working against is um, a rise of the marauders uh, i thought that was very cool i liked it it's unfortunate that this chapter was so long and so packed with so many things that they really did not have time to get into the Marauders. Who's the leader? What techniques are they using? What makes them so dangerous at this time? I think a storyteller would have a lot to work with and could make that very interesting. So again, I'm glad they used the Marauders this way. And I, I'm not upset that uh, they skimped on Marauder details because there was just too much in this chapter. Also, I think, uh, again, getting back to structure, I think it was a very good idea to have a lot of these high impact uh, seekings for your player characters towards the end of the game. Uh, not only is it is it interesting, it not only does it rope in one of the key concepts of Mage into this you know, grand story, but also uh, structurally it has a uh, a purpose. The players are going to face up against a big bad villain at the end of this story who is very, very powerful. So there is a good reason to have a bunch of seeking so that you can raise the arete of your player characters towards the end of the story so that they're stronger going into this big fight. So it, it's fun, it's interesting, and it is appropriate uh, looking at the um, the big climax for this story. So uh, yeah, I, I just say hats off to Malcolm Shepard for uh, taking a lot of ideas, a lot of content, a lot of events, and giving it a structure that as a storyteller reading this chapter, I'm thinking, I could run this. This isn't just you know a crazy idea for a crazy story. It's a crazy story. I, I feel like I could run. It's 10 pounds as a mage in a five pound chapter, though. Uh, I certainly agree with that. The next chapter is chapter three. The revolution will be televised. Adam, can you tell how the world ends in this one? 
Yeah, I'm going to walk us through uh, chapter three, and this is a non-canon uh, story. There were there were four sto- uh, stories in here about the end of the world that are not the canon story, in case you want to take things in a different direction. So this story focuses on the technocracy. Although there are some mentions for possible tradition mage involvement, this story, for the most part, assumes technocracy player characters. Uh, some background helps us understand the basic conflict here. In the latter days of first edition, early days of second edition, the technocracy opened up as a player option. To support this, the very universe unified and sinister technocracy became separated into the leadership and the front lines. The leadership kept their secrets to themselves, were largely in horizon constructs, and remained sinister. The front lines were more like regular people, lived on Earth, and for the most part wanted to help humanity. Second edition emphasized the divide between the priorities of the leaders who were distant and the front lines who were actually confronting the problems. Revised edition removed much of the leadership so that the front line technocrats were left to their own devices. Without leadership pushing them, the front liners reduced the attacks on tradition mages and focused on practical concerns. This story brings the leadership versus front lines conflict back onto center stage. At the beginning of Revised Edition, an ancient vampire is destroyed in India. The Avatar Storm follows. These two events shake up the technocracy's highest level of leadership called Control. That's with a capital C. Control has been mentioned several times in mage books. It is a committee of technocrats that live off of Earth and are very mysterious. Control runs the numbers to adjust the timetable that dictate technocratic policy, and they discover Earth has around five years left, no more. We learn control has been disembodied and are now spirits, but retained their mental faculties. They live in a realm in the deep umbra, and they are centuries old. The two groups within the technocracy that face off in this story are the unionists, who want to make humans masters of their world, and the loyalists, those who serve the technocracy chain of command and seek to control everything. Panopticon, a group inside the technocracy introduced in Manifesto, Transmissions from the Rogue Council, obey the loyalists. In chapter one, the Void Engineers announce an increase in paranormal activity around the world and warn the other conventions. Actions against tradition mages are dropped as technocrats focus on the strange things happening to sleepers. By chapter two, the players should be involved in efforts to fight the mounting strangeness. The gauntlet is thinning and supernatural threats are popping up. Technocracy leadership in orbit reestablishes communications. A result of this is pressure to punish agents that have acted on their own since the Avatar storm started. Another result is changes in the chain of command, which increases the chaos. Alien beings called Anakim are appearing and kidnapping sleepers or starting isolated compounds to influence them. In Chapter 3, storms and other atmospheric disturbances accompany the activation of normal people into psychics, mages, and other empowered individuals. These people are called chosen and add to the chaos worldwide. Technocrats work to understand this new factor that is energizing people. In Chapter 4, disembodied mages on the other side of the gauntlet start appearing on Earth. Technocrat leaders in Horizon Constructs start appearing to lead loyalists against unionists. Sleeper society starts to panic with conflicting reports of terrorism, natural disasters, and political turmoil. In Chapter 5, the struggle between unionists and loyalists intensifies. Control starts communicating with Earth again, and they side with the unionists. The worldwide chaos increases, and newly awakened mages are dying in paradox backlashes. Both the unionists and loyalists consider using new technology to unleash avatar shards on each other's locations to wipe out enlightened individuals. At the end of the chapter, Control tells people on Earth about the critical mass of avatar shards that will soon destroy the gauntlet. In chapter 6, avatar shards break through to cripple all mages in one location. You decide which. Their erite becomes zero. As the struggle between the loyalists and unionists continues, the technocracy is fragmenting. Each side might use avatar shards as a doomsday weapon. Four possible outcomes are listed, two where the unionists win, one for the loyalists, and one where everyone gets the shaft. Someone gives the players the means to open the floodgates, or close the floodgates, or just shield people from the avatar shards. You'll have to work out which. We get some notes on what a loyalist victory looks like in the end, what a unionist victory looks like, uh, one where technocrats barely survive, and one where mages are wiped out worldwide, but the players escape off-world. My thoughts on this story. The story needed a good editor, frankly. Uh, The writing takes too long to get points across. It repeats information, uh, information about the situation before the story starts, and events in the story are mixed to a degree that requires the reader to sort things out. This wasn't so much a story as rough suggestions for a story. As such, it should have been shorter. The only NPC we get is a sample Anakim running a religious compound that might get taken down early in the story. There are two sample Umbrud 
but they are little more than stat blocks. If it wasn't for the illustrations, I'd have no idea what to do with these two Umbrud. There are no locations. The revelation about the members of Control was interesting uh, in the beginning of the chapter, but brief, and nothing was done with it afterwards. It wasn't developed. It wasn't taken anywhere. Uh, Past mage books contain a wealth of lore on the technocracy that could have been used here, but it wasn't. I like the technocracy, but I just can't get behind this story. I think it's 23 pages of missed opportunity, but uh, that's my take on it. Uh, Terry, what did you think of Chapter 3? I thought it was a weird mix of TUI revised and projection. The author of this chapter, Brian Campbell, was not, to the best of my knowledge, involved in revised, and sometimes that showed. The unionist-loyalist split, I thought, made uh, perfect sense. The the talk about, in the late 90s, the traditions knocking out three horizon constructs, which weakened Earth's defenses, I, I don't remember a reference to that before. I, I didn't either. Yeah. So that's interesting. That's an event that happened. And I could super see that being a reason why the technocracy is like, oh, we're going to murderate these guys' asses. The idea that there was a cache of books that revealed the technocracy's early history and the suggestion that most technocrats don't know the history of the technocracy, that didn't feel like it jived with what I remember. It felt like one of those things where there are different theories of where the technocracy came from and everyone is familiar with all of them. And the important part as a technocrat is to spout the party line based on what your boss thinks. Eventually we get three different theories. So to say that the early history is kind of shrouded, the idea that the technocracy would destroy its own history is an interesting idea. It just doesn't feel supported by the canon. Yeah, when when we were reading through the red sign, there was a mention of how the Templars dug up some uh, authentic books of uh, early uh, technocracy history, and that was throwing people into turmoil. And I'm I'm 100% behind Terry. When I was reading that, I was thinking, I I can't see how this would cause so much turmoil. I thought everybody had heard different rumors, and you basically line up with what your boss thinks and get on with your day. Yeah. It's a neat idea. It just doesn't feel like it matches with what we already knew. Again, this proves that the real star of Ascension are the Viasilicos because they pop up again, baby. Uh, I thought that was cool. (laughs) We get Project Colon Clarity and Project Colon Invictus, which you need to remember is different from Project No Colon Invictus. Project No Colon Invictus being something involved with people who've had gastric bypasses and ostomies, obviously. But... (laughs) The idea that the awakening of Ravnos, the Zapathosaurus awakening, killed hundreds of thousands of the technocracy is like, we just can't hide that. There's only so much we can do. And that was the moment that reality started weakening, I think is interesting, because later we get references to Operation Sunburst, where the technocracy is like, you know what's fun? Killing vampires. You know what we have an excuse to do now? Kill vampires. What do you want to do this weekend? I don't know. Kill some vampires. And I am fine with that for absolute days. One of the things that the this chapter also brought up that was interesting that is, I think, touched on once or twice but never really leaned into is part of why the schism occurs in Revised is because the constant social conditioning is no longer being maintained. And I thought that was a, that was a neat idea. This is a more conspiratorial, more backstab be more paranoid technocracy, which we got in previous editions, and this gives you an end time story for that. So this really feels like if second edition, like first second edition, got to have its own uh, end time plot. So it's interesting, but it doesn't quite fit. Yeah. This chapter is entitled The Earth Will Shake. And this like and they're like, the key theme of this one compared to the other one is everybody's boned. And then you get to chapter five in which everyone's boned. And then to chapter six in which everyone's super boned. <laughs> so you're like, we need to set our heights on this. This section was written by Sam and Abinat, who you may know from second edition. And it carries that penchant for, for two E literary flourishes, which very quickly brought me back. And in some cases annoyed the heck out of me. The theme here is inevitability. And the mood is one of mounting desperation. The earth is going to get hit by something. Except if your characters do everything right and they're not it by something. Anyway, while the chapter is unfolding, there is also a parallel track, which later they recommend using cutscenes to explain, where there is a celestial ball explaining what is unfolding in the Umbra. Get some information on asteroids. We get a long occult aside on the importance of asteroids and comets and how they tie into the Sephiroth. 
I appreciate this in that it is not just tying the Sephiroth to spheres. So great. There's some wild speculation and then a side story about how the author lost their copy of Promethea issue 20, the comic by Alan Moore that is considered one of the inspirations for later mage. Hopefully we'll do an episode on Promethea and the invisibles at some point, but we do a lot of reading for the show. So to add more reading to that, it may take a little bit. It mentions that comets may be chemical messengers that seeded life between planets. Also that since they are physical objects that move between between the physical embodiments of the near and the deep umbra, entities could use them to move back and forth. So if you're an umbrood who's got a lot of time on their hands and wants to go from the deep umbra to the near umbra, that's one way of doing it. The key conflict is set up in that the Abners are a great-grandfather great-granddaughter pair who found evidence that a comet is heading for Earth. No one is listening to them. At first, it's because they think everyone thinks they're a kook, but actually it turns out that Leland Chan, who is a marauder whose parents thought that their awakened ability were signs that they were one of the chosen from the Olympia galaxy, believes that the comet is coming to take them home and very much does not want that to be disrupted. This character is a marauder. I really wish they were just a regular mage. Like, if you can have Vormos not be a Marauder or a Nefandi, you can have Leland Chan just be a mage that has an out-there paradigm without them being a Marauder. That, that's me. Uh, no, me I back that up. Yeah. Uh, meanwhile, in the Umbra, things are upset. The low Umbra starts to make room. The middle Umbra is going a little nuts. And the high Umbra has whispers abounding of something about the happening. The idea of the, the Umbra as foreshadowing is something that we've never gotten before. We've generally gotten it as a reaction to what happens. So I think this is an interesting inversion in the end times that you're like, oh, dink, the Umbra is responding to something that hasn't happened yet. The characters will meet the Abners. Somehow, Leland Chan may send a group of ninjas ninja assassins or something. Typhon, the comet in question, was set on a path to hit Earth thousands of years ago. The characters may need to get old records from old civilizations to predict the comet's path, and that may involve a trek across the world. Uh, the book references the Velikovsky heresies, which I think this is I, the second time they have come up in Mage after Society of Ether revised, which uh, Velikovsky posited that some weird anomalies in very old observances may have been caused by an electromagnetic disturbance between the planets that caused the earth, Mars and Venus to be very close. It, is interesting in that it explains one oddity by completely breaking how electromagnetism works. So on the whole, not a lot of people are super into it. We have this global trek. Dr. Comet may appear, who is this remarkably high Arite low power mage uh, who suffers under a giant paradox flaw and time flows backwards around them, but may be able to help them. Meanwhile, in the Vulgate, this giant comet has slowly started approaching and then it sends down these rock shards that contain golem spirits in it. The characters may have an opportunity to meet Diana, who is obviously the moon, who is on the quest to recruit aid if they go to the Vulgate to investigate, as well as major Vulgatic entities in the High Umbra being like, ah, oh, what's all this then? In Chapter 3, we get the conflagration. This is the responses. As people realize that this comet is coming close... Some people may want to send a group of people to the Umbra at, for safekeeping. The Order organizes a response to affect the Celestines, the Order of Hermes, that is. The Society of Ether is in disarray. Some wish to leave Earth in Ether ships. Other ones want to come up with grand plans. The Verbena want to move the moon to disrupt the comet. Uh, mortal agencies will notice it and may try and nuke it. Seymour Glass from the Book of Madness, who is actually a scientist, who is actually a Void Engineer, who is actually a Nefondus, is the one who has been interfering partially with the Triple Thorpe's event uh, attempts to tell people. He became a Nefondus because he looked through a cursed telescope and saw Agda Shagla, who is a character mentioned in, again, the Book of Madness, the, the Dweller in Outer Darkness. The characters eventually may meet a disguised Gaia who is resigned over being betrothed to something, who hates humanity and likes animals. At some point, a giant meteor creature arrives, sees Gaia, and demands his bride. The characters are then invited to go to the Celestial Ball, whereby they have a chance to see the planet's act out their thoughts about this union with the outer planets being somewhat aloof. There's an opportunity for the players to learn that Mars has helped this occur, that the spirit of Mars is angry that Earth got life and that it didn't, but you can convince Mars to throw a moon at it if you can show that Mars is going to get screwed by this uh, gravitational interference. All of the attempts to avert the comet kind of cancel out, and the proto-comet was flung by the spirit of the planet of the asteroid belt, 
that had previously held life until its denizens got too powerful and literally blew up their planet. So all the other planets are like, why does Earth just get life? Let's get together and screw up Earth. And the idea was that since the sentient life on that planet caused it to explode, that they need to wipe out all life on Earth to stop it. But this isn't really well thought through because, like, they want to kill off all the humans, but the only way to kill off all the humans seemingly is to kill off the everything, which is the whole thing they're trying to avoid. Apparently, planets are good at long-term planning. I don't know. Or maybe I mis misread it. They are able to go out to this mesa that is coterminous with the continuum orrery in the high umbra as i mentioned this is where the agenda of the planets are done at best it suggests that the characters can avert some of the harm and reduce something that will destroy the entirety of humanity to something that will merely end civilization allowing us to create the most popular of all mage supplements cormac mccarthy's the road it goes through considerations your characters will need to have to allow civilization in some way to continue that the spot furthest from impact is likely parts of Mongolia, that they will need food to survive. If they have no success whatsoever, all life on the planet is functionally eradicated. It is expunged by mile-high waves going half the speed of sound circling the Earth. For 10 years, acid rain troubles the ground after the oceans evaporate. Uh, if humanity dies, the Vulgates and the Spires retreat to the Epiphanies, but the spirit wilds persist. The low umber grows and consumes the River of Language, which is now covered in Walking Dead. So that was a chapter. Uh, I think the idea is neat. I like the idea of um, the Umbra foretelling something and the need to create colonies elsewhere. Very one y 2 -y, Gonzo style to it, which is fine if that's a thing you like. It's just real uh, nuts to the walls, I'll say. I think a small version of this would be real interesting. I think the you need to stop a comet plot is a perfectly reasonable one. And the fact that mages would have so many different ways of approaching it, I think is interesting in that you could literally convince a Celestine to interfere or you could try and move the moon or you could do the Society of Ether kook science thing or you could try and nuke it or something like that. I thought were, were interesting. There were a lot of digressions. There were a lot of literary flourishes, which in a chapter that is otherwise so vague is sometimes a little bit frustrating. There's a bunch of actual information on what certain types of calamities look like, how comets and planetoids and planetesimals and so on work, which I thought was fine. I don't think it went overboard. It wasn't one of those things where I would go, I would just Google this. I think it was a reasonably good mix of things. If you want the Armageddon plot where the characters have to go to space to blow up a comet, here's, here's your mage option for that. What do you think, Adam? Reading this chapter, it was very clear that the author is a lot more interested in astronomy than I am. Yeah, I, I just thought there's there's so much astronomy data. It's like, yeah, yeah, I know you're big on astronomy. Maybe I'm not. It describes this uh, umbrewed character called Mother Earth that is going to enter into the story at one point. And after reading that, I thought, wow, this Mother Earth character sounds so irritating <laughs> that I'm going, as a storyteller, I'm going to look for excuses to, to edit this character out because it, it would irritate me to portray her. She, she's always complaining. She's rude. She's demanding. It's like, hey, why, why don't we just, uh, I think the players would like dump her in a minute. So why, why even bring her in? I got the feeling that there were several places in this story where you're supposed to basically railroad the characters. It's like, okay, you guys are going to do this now. No, no, seriously. You're going to do this now. And so I wasn't really fond of that. Yeah, there were some interesting ideas about seeing uh, celestial events play out on a human scale by going to the celestial ball. I, I guess there's some interest in that. It was an interesting thing to sort of imagine. That idea I might like to play with. But, you yeah, this particular story... I felt didn't have so much to offer for me. Uh, honestly, I think this would have been a great place to uh, have a marauder-based end-of-the-world scenario. And if that kind of catastrophe wasn't enough for you when something bad happens from space, instead of space ha sending something to come hit us, let's hear a story about space taking something away from us. Adam, what happened in the next chapter? Chapter 5 is titled A Whimper, Not a Bang, and the basic concept here is a story about the end coming without sleepers noticing it. Only mages are going to, to know about this end-of-the-world scenario. Uh, this story focuses on the material we've seen on Aliens and Mage, the Kaluan, the Star Council, the Thalhun, and the Zigrigler. Yes, they're back. Uh, I'm, I'm just going to say Zigrigler. I think Terry has the proper pronunciation of that. We're going to check with him. But uh, for now, I'm just going to run with uh, what I can get out of my mouth. <laughs> This story uses NPCs and locations from
An oddball from Las Vegas has inside info on alien activity along with secret data on his laptop. The players hear about two different races of aliens working against each other and two secret societies involved with them. In part one, magic becomes harder to use. Clues point to Area 51 near Las Vegas and San Francisco, where both secret societies are. Area 51 is an impregnable fortress, so San Francisco is the better bet. Three members of the Star Council are hiding alien tech in a warehouse. A cabal of hermetics is hard to find, but not impossible, and may offer further clues. In part two, thugs from the Thalhun attack the players, suggesting the group is no longer the harmless idealists we saw in World of Darkness Sorcerer. In part three, the players know of an alien craft stored at Area 51, and they should have the device that controls it. By now, they've also made some uh, alliances with hermetics who can help them actually approach Area 51. On their way to Nevada, the Zigregler attack. In part Four, the players are breaking into Area 51 and hijacking a spacecraft. And as I said, by this point, they're going to have some support in doing that. Greys, the the gray aliens, the short guys with like funny looking heads and huge black eyes, are rumored to have very small butts. So the players might want to bring some cushions. Otherwise, the seats in the spaceship are going to be murder. In part five, the spacecraft takes the players to the dimension where the extraterrestrial leader of the Thalhun keeps his city. The Zirgregler attack the city and players can either help defend it or use the chaos to pursue their own goals. They learn human avatars are being captured by Kuvon, patron of the Thalhun, and used to power the city's systems. By part six, magic is almost completely drained out of Earth. If the Zigrigler win, all magic will be gone from Earth, and sorcerers and mages will have to get real jobs. If the Zigrigler are driven off, the players will have to contend with Kuvon and the Thalhun. If they can gain control of the city, it will drift into a new dimension. Earth still loses magic, but the players are in on the ground floor of a new world where magic is possible. I thought this story was very interesting. We learn the Zigrugler work to kidnap mages to drain their avatars for energy. We learn the Thalhun weren't just deluded. There really was a Kuvan, and it also kidnaps mages to power its city. We learn of the Void Engineer's secret war against the Kaluan and why they fight it. The sinister take on the previously silly Thalhun, I think, is fun. Uh, sidebars offer rules on six successive stages of increasing difficulty for magic, and I think they could be used for several of the other stories in this book quite well. At the end, it offers advice on handling paradox in a less vulgar, flashy way. I guess that's nice, but didn't we already know that? I found the story well-constructed and playable. It has built-in flexibility, but enough detail to engage me. It works as a serious story, but I would enjoy playing it as a light-hearted romp. The elements are all there for some funny scenes. I can picture a player saying, But I thought mages were the secret masters of the world. And the alien says, Nah, all us aliens use you guys for batteries. You're, you're smelly, but convenient. Or when the players see the majestic city of Kuvan with its massive gemstones. So this is what the cities of your people look like. And Kuvan says, this joint? Nah, I found Atlantis drifting through the embers, a derelict fixer-upper, but cheaper than building my own city, you know? So when the Thalhun are gangsters and the Awakened are used as gas tanks, it gets hard for me to be all that dramatic. Uh, my criticisms. I think the story works perfectly well with no connection to the end of the world. If I'm going to end everything, I, I wouldn't do it quite like this. The story would work great in between two more serious stories, uh, so I'd like to bring the players home afterwards. If the players are going to have an aerial battle with the Zigrigler over Kuvan City, I'd like some suggestions on how to handle that. At least tell me where to find some ship stats and aerial combat rules. They, they have been published in, in previous mage books. I sort of remember that, but I can't remember where. If the players fight the Zigrigler in the city, then give me something to make the city unique. How is fighting there different than fighting on some Earth city? Again, if you're going to have a location in a story, make there be something interesting about that place. I'll bet running through the alleyways of uh, Kuvan City and having mage duels is going to be somehow different than, say, Los Angeles or New York. But uh, that wraps up my thoughts. Terry, this was one wild chapter. I am just waiting to hear your take on it. Yeah, as opposed to the, all the previous chapters where they're like, we're going to take a normal thing and make it seem batshit crazy. We're like, let's take the batshit part and make it seem entirely reasonable. And I'm like, and it's just the, the gif of Orson Welles clapping in the back of the theater um, was my response to this. Uh, really, my only criticisms are small. Conrad Hubbard does a great job with aliens uh, the author for this section the increasing magic difficulty is v remarkably punishing the fact that at each level it adds one to the difficulty but also adds one to the threshold successes required that increases 
very quickly in terms of difficulty. By the time you're you're facing Kuvan, magic is at a plus three difficulty. You need at least three threshold successes for anything to work. And at this point, supernatural backgrounds and flaws have also diminished in most cases. Uh, magic is nearly impossible under those circumstances. It just I, I did some back of the envelope calculations in a character uh, it, that you need an arete of seven or eight to have a good chance of a two dot effect actually happening. Increasing difficulty like this is very punishing unless the characters have access to a lot of things to simplify magic. I would do the just increase in difficulty. I think the threshold success requirement gets very messy unless your characters have exceptionally high retails, which they may have in the end time. Go on. I, I agree that that is a good point. I guess I had an assumption I didn't realize I was making, and that was that when the cities, uh, when when the players uh, hijack the spaceship and they leave Earth and they get to Kuvan City, it's like reality is different there. Mm, so okay. the players would be relieved to be able to do their magic again. But yeah, you make a good point. It does not spell that out in the chapter, and so maybe the author was assuming that. I, I like your version too, where everything gets harder and harder and harder until you break into that hangar and suddenly you're surrounded by avatars and magic gets easy again. That would make it uh, much more attractable uh, for your for your final battle. An interesting thing that I'm not sure I've seen before, but unawakened characters are also given essences. Otherwise, it's fun. It really wraps up a thread uh, between the Kalawan, the Ziggurat the Void Engineers, and the rest of, of Magedom. It explains what happens with the Star Council and the Thal Hun in a pretty fascinating way, and I thought it was fun. And as Adam said, this is, this is a story you can run anyway. You can just scale it down and run it. Chapter 5 is all magic being destroyed. Chapter 6 is there being a little too much magic, maybe. Adam, what happens in Chapter 6? Well, chapter six is entitled Hell on Earth, and it's about the Nefandi bringing about the end of the world. As the title implies, it's no picnic. In this story, we learn how powerful the Nefandi leadership really are and how negative and corrupt humanity has become. Because of these two factors, when the Nefandi move against the Earth, there's no real way to stop them. In fact, a sidebar aptly named One Hell of a Downer reminds us it isn't good to railroad your players to an unavoidable conclusion, but states that that's the point of this story. I'm more inclined to stand behind the players who quote Captain Kirk in The Wrath of Khan, I don't believe in the no-win scenario. That suggests one possible problem with building an end-of-the-world story around the Nefandi. The world needs to come to an end, but if the Nefandi engineer it, doesn't that always look like a player fail? Uh, anyways, uh, from here we get new background material on Nefandi leadership. Al Azwad is brought back from the first Book of Madness. He gets an upgrade from Fallen Oracle to first and primary Nefandis. The new material on Al Azwad, uh, now called The Unnamed, is interesting, although I have to admit it's rather simplistic in a way. Uh, because he's the first and most powerful Nefandis, he has fundamental control over all other Nefandi. His plan was to gain influence over Horizon Chantry's realm so he could use it later. Uh, the mysterious 10th Council seat and newly formed continent uh, that we get from Horizon Stronghold of Hope were placed there by the unnamed so he would become linked at a deep level with the Horizon realm. A storyteller could get some mileage out of reworking this material, but I won't speculate on that here. We also learn the Rogue Council was the unnamed yanking everyone's chain. In part one, the unnamed and his Azwadim break into Horizon Chantry and raid the Quintessence supplies. He begins sending his mystic influence through the Quintessence lines to nodes on Earth. The final transmission from the Rogue Council informs everyone the unnamed is now in charge and spoiling for a fight. Mages gather in Germany to plan the assault on Horizon Chantry. The players are approached by a mysterious figure who hands them a key and tells them a tomb in Horizon Chantry will take the players directly to Doisetep's ruins. When they get there, the key turns into a working portal to Balador, Pleasure Dome of the Cult of Ecstasy. Marianne of Balador says hello and offers drinks. The mages hiding out in Balador didn't disembody because they had a Prime Matrix. What? You didn't know about Prime Matrixes staving off disembodiment in the Umbra? Where have you been? In part two, the unnamed pushes the Avatar Storm out of the gauntlet in both directions to kill countless people on Earth and in the Umbra. The mages of Balador give the players the Greater Parma Magica, a wonder that is a shield with powerful protection against magic. The unnamed shows up to attack. Senex of the Euthanatos wounds the unnamed but dies in the attempt. The winds of the Avatar Storm die down and the unnamed beats a retreat. On Earth, many Nefandi grow in power and come out in the open. The gauntlet falls, and countless evil beings from the Umbra torment Earth. In 
Part 3, we start with a lull in the action. The players have one to four weeks to make plans. We're told most of these plans won't work, but don't tell your players. When the Aswadim who serve the unnamed destroy the world tree... Uh, that allowed mages to travel and send their magic to distant places. That is a further disaster. Most of the remaining oracles and masters are then killed by the Nefandi. As the earth is dying from the unnamed magics, the Order of Hermes makes a stand in Egypt. This is a distraction so the players can attack Mus in the Umbra. If they succeed, the resistance gains a safe haven. Not that that's going to change the eventual outcome, but it's nice to have a safe haven. In part four, Earth is in a mess. Society, technology, and laws of physics break down. There's a brief description of what that might look like. Um, Rubbing sticks together won't uh, ignite fire anymore. As a storyteller, I don't really know how to run with that. But anyways, the technocracy falls apart. Voyage engineers offer equipment and tasks to the mage resistance. The players are chosen to handle the deal. The resistance and the defondi pause to strengthen their positions. Part 5 starts with Acrates Salonica, student of Shazar the Seer, realizing his attempt to avoid the dark prophecy of Moloch was futile. As he makes a mystic cry to mages everywhere, the Nefandi kill him. This depresses everyone. If your players giggle, steal their quintessence. That'll teach them. Less than 10% of non-Nefandi mages are left now. The players are now influential leaders. They have a few months to dig in, gather stragglers, and be depressed about the end of everything. Part 6 starts with the Nefandi lords appearing on Earth to announce their victory. The world is ravaged and horrors appear everywhere. The five Aswadim and other Nefandi lords get their own territories and erect their capitals. Players can't do anything to stop them. Game over. Then we get stats on the unnamed and some info on his five Aswadim. A suggestion is made to launch a new chronicle where the players can lead a resistance against the Nefandi, but it will take at least hundreds of years to succeed. So have fun with that one. Uh, My thoughts on this story. First off, on page 168, quote, In such a case, perhaps any of your characters who are members of those traditions become literally the only survivors of those awakened mystic paradigms. Yet another acknowledgement of group paradigms in revised edition, which officially states that individual paradigms is how you should handle paradigms in mage. But uh, that was fun for me. Uh, The prime matrix keeping Balador in good shape is quite the plot device. It's mentioned in passing, and that's all. So if you would like to know what a prime matrix is, you're going to have to work that one out on your own. The idea that a collection of mages was hiding there for four years and not helping their allies makes them look very callous, I think. I can see why the unnamed added a tenth seat to the council table in Horizon Chantry and added a new continent. What I can't see is how these new additions didn't have resonance that would give the Nefandi away. And this is over the course of years. The battle between Senex and the unnamed reduces the players to spectators, uh, not something I recommend for uh, stories you're running. Saying the world tree is an actual physical tree kind of lessened it for me. I like to think of the world tree as taking the appearance of a great tree in certain situations, but not actually being a big physical tree. Uh, The numerous damage control sidebars in this chapter assume a linear path through this story. I don't really like advising a storyteller to make a railroad and then giving hints on how to keep the players on that railroad. I mean, the author did state up front that that's what he was going to do, but... I don't agree that was a great idea. The unnamed has his stats at the end. He has a willpower of 20. Yeah, that's 20. Erite, 10. Uh, Five spheres over five. The rest at five. He's got limitless quintessence. Okay, your villain is unstoppable. We get it. I like having a story that features the Nefandi, but there must have been a better way to do it than this, uh, in my opinion. Uh, So, Terry, what was your take on Six? I thought it had a really interesting opening in that it basically says that the Ascension War is being fought over people that don't care. More than being sad, this story is cynical. And it very much says this story only works if you have presented the sleepers as being uncaring in the face of the future, in which case that is the only way in which the unnamed one could triumph. I thought that was a very good framing of things and is a very grim, dark portrayal of things. And if that is the chronicle you have run, this is the natural story out the other side. If you have run a world of hope where mortals are trying to change things, but it's really hard, then this setup seems like it could really be a downer as opposed to in other cases where you're like, oh no, this is the natural byproduct of what the sleepers have been doing. It gives an interesting view into the early history of the Nefandi, which basically says, 
one person sacrificed their name to the outer darkness that was eschewed from creation. And it took this character three tries to figure out how to corrupt humanity to, to let those entities back in that they did the first thing and it resulted in squabbling the second time that they were banished. But eventually starting in the year, I think it was 313, they were able to get this plan up and running. It gives a new reflection on the Nefondic action during World War II. It just kind of withheld aid because their followers had had kind of missed the point of the pact that they had made with Outer Darkness. So it is kind of fascinating the way it's like, yes, a lot of Nefondi are absolutely decadent, but that's not the point, and you've miss, missed it. We get a lot of references to various Nefondi across editions here, and I thought that was kind of cool. We get stats for Gelidian, which in other books are represented as being some of the most powerful Nefondi that exist, and this one has like an Arite of uh, four and a bunch of spheres at two. So, I mean, that's Terry's nitpick for the chapter. I don't know why the scene involving the Pleasure Dome at Barrel Door even existed. It's like, hey, here are these Archmasters having a party that have ignored what's been going on in the meantime. Y you could come up with a justification, something, 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 time magic. But the fact that they're able to injure the unnamed one, but not slay them, Senex dies, but then the Outer Bowl is destroyed, cutting them off. I, at that point, I don't even know what, what purpose that scene kind of played. The Outer Bowl being manifest, I thought was kind of cool. The idea is at some point the gauntlet falls and what was previously a figurative tree now becomes a literal tree that mortals and so on can deal with. I thought that was an interesting plot idea that you could have anywhere else. So if you have a setting where the gauntlet falls briefly in one place, I think the Outer Bowl materializing in mortals getting lost in it uh, could be kind of fun. Uh, some people say this is a hopeful scenario because ultimately you have the ability to rebuild. But uh, as Adam said, the, the, there's a section where it's like, if you rub two sticks together, the stick may bleed, but it won't produce fire. I have no idea how to run a game in that world, especially against characters with a retay of seven or eight I don't know if they're functionally stating that that all magic is now coincidental or if the Earth is now a reality zone that only allows for the blasphemous. I don't know. So there were a lot of interesting ideas. It was a it was a bit of a, a downer on the whole. It had some interesting ideas, but if I actually ran it, I'm not sure it would quite hold together. Uh, I do appreciate that the author is like, hey, here's what to do if your characters don't participate in certain events. But it does kind of depend on this this linear progression of things, as well as your character, despite like everything breaking down, still having the ability to go around the world. It also doesn't answer basic questions where if you have these six or seven entities that essentially rule the earth, how does the rest of humanity live in in such a place? Like it doesn't kind of answer that what a world of hellfire really looks like to me. So I would have liked more information on that. But it's an interesting outline. Uh, and it's well written. I thought the uh, the text itself was was well done. And those are my thoughts on chapter six. Yeah. Tell me about chapter seven. I will, darn it. The final chapter is entitled Designing Ascension, and this one should have come first. It is a rundown of the high-level characters that are present, and it starts out with a note that says, these NPCs are not here so that your characters don't have to do something. These are here to show you the kind of characters your characters can interact with when determining the fate of the world. And I like that reminder. And it kind of presents that within each major faction within Mage, there are two groups that are doing something. For instance, within the tradition, you have the New Horizon Council, which is the quiet counterpart to the Rogue Council. That you have the emissaries of the Sphinx that are like, yeah, let's take the fight to the Technocrats. And then the New Horizon Council who's like, mm, no. And it goes through who the New Horizon Council is, consisting of Mark Gillen, Nguyen, Simon Payne, Leanne Milner, Netzalak Raymond, Alexander Morrow, Edward Gilmore, Yves Mercure, Hector Dujago, and Catherine Blass. These are the characters that are generally on the cover of each of the tradition books in Revised, or were at least indicated as being kind of a key character within them. The counterpart to that is the Sphinx. Within the Technocracy, you have Ragnarok, which kind of took over after 
the rising of Zapathosaura that has been deploying cross-convention groups of up to 24 agents, but was not prepared for the rise of the Sphinx saying, yeah, you should fight the technocrats because they're like, well, everything's quiet. Let's take care of other things. The technocracy, uh, the tradition seemed to have taken it in the teeth. When the Sphinx starts broadcasting, Panopticon is created, renews the pogrom, and some who have previously enjoyed great freedom within the technocracy are now kind of annoyed that there's this centralized command telling them what to do. Within the Nefandi, we even have two groups the Eaters of the Week, who were the old-school worshippers of the Void, as well as the Hive Dwellers that are entities in the Umbra composed of the various castes that we talked about in Book of Mandus Revised, kind of creating this weird twin to the Dark Umbra, the Labyrinths of the Nefandi compared to the Labyrinths of the Hive Dwellers, and that there's kind of a, a fight between these two factions. Even within the Marauders, we have the Chayath Hekadesh, uh, who are this group of weird Gnostics who want to free humanity through murder and the citrine which are kind of in charge of them and you're kind of old school wacky marauders involving like the butcher street irregulars it also goes as an aside it's like oh yeah the technocracy may be split also crafts may be doing something i don't know and you're like okay it also mentions that retroactively a bunch of the seeds of ascension were laid out previously in history that this is not the first time an avastar storm happened that it happened once before during world war ii and the nazis tried to create a super storm warden and more information on that plot line is included in manifesto transmissions from the rogue council which i kept calling Calling the rogue cabal. We find out why the avatar storm hurts mages when someone crosses over the, the shards seek a soul and if there's nothing there's not an avatar already there they lodge in it. Acolytes who have crossed into the umbra have been quietly awakening which I think mages may have noticed but anyway uh, the problem is mages already have an awakened avatar so when these shards kind of come through they fight and that's uh, and some of them get displaced and some of them stay which is how it can result in the inadvertent guild ghoul which has been previously mentioned though that even though we never get any sort of information on it or mechanics on it and that these elements can start to be involved in seekings as these little bits of avatar shard bits start wearing themselves through this chapter really did explain a lot and I think it should have come much earlier especially if you're using the the judgment scenario, but I could also see why they might hold it to last because it gives you kind of more canony information that might contradict the specifics that are in any of these one stories. So they may want to hold off on, I, I don't know. It gave information on the Holy Union rote, which allows you to integrate these shards safely to become a Storm Warden and gain a bunch of other powers to manipulate avatars, which is just absolutely OP. And again, me putting on my, my math hat again, it indicates that you need 14 successes on an extended effect that is automatically vulgar without witnesses because your avatar is like, wait, what are you trying to do to me? No. And it says that on top of that, it is automatically done at a plus two difficulty. So there's a life five version and there's a prime four version. So if you do the life five version, which is vulgar without witnesses, that's automatically difficulty nine plus two, that is going to be difficulty nine requiring three threshold successes to get uh, two threshold successes to get anything to happen. To get 14 successes on that without botching, without absolutely hideous outlays of quintessence in your sanctum, so on and so forth, is nearly impossible. As difficulties increase in mage, the, the odds of botching on any extended action just absolutely skyrocket. So I would make it a little bit easier. To me, this is one of those cases where it's a plot device, or it's something where you find a grimoire that walks you through the process, and you need to transmit that around. We get more information on the psychopomps and how they worked. A bunch of the information at this point in the book have been delivered in two or three different places, and they don't all necessarily agree with one another. Like the, the relationship between the Anunnaki the Anakim, the Psychopomps, and so on uh, was a little bit messy. We also got some information on how to run this as a crossover with other lines. And it's like, uh, what if the Weaver and, and a few other kind of cases like that uh, we get more hidden history. We get information on the Senex being guided by the Phoenix. I would have loved more information about those various psychopomps and so on. We get a vague reference to the uh, the bans that were passed to prevent the psychopomps from returning and how Hillel was able to negotiate around them. It provides an option that it's like the Rogue Council was formed of mage bent on ascension that had been blocked by the psychopomps from returning to the Well of Souls. And you're like, that's a lot. These avatars ultimately created sendings that drove masters from the Umbra so they could avoid discorporeate. Dante interfered because 
these are the cool things you can do when, when your retail is that high. We get a little bit more information on Operation Sunburst, which I mentioned earlier about the technocracy responding to the rise of the first of the antediluvians. We get some information on saying, hey, maybe you want to involve the Earthbound or the Judges of Ma'at or the Messengers, and maybe they're the same thing as the Psychopomps. And then kind of most importantly, we get information on the Fractured Cosmos, which is this idea that multiple realities exist next to each other. Each game line is in one of these realities, and they're close enough that they share elements. Mages could possibly move between them by going very far into the Deep Umber and then coming back out again. Uh, it is suggested that this may be the same thing as the Everett volumes or mirror zones that are represented elsewhere. New universes could be formed either by a particularly deep quiet or by inverting the flow of a node. And in this case, everyone gets to be right. I like this because it removes the idea that different game lines don't agree with each other. Uh, this is something that was very informed, I think, by either Grant Morrison or Alan Moore. I don't remember which, but the author uh, in a different publication is like, yeah, this is where kind of I got this from. And then we get some information on storytelling, which is to say you have three key questions. How will you foreshadow events? How will you handle the plot? And how will you deal with unconventional solutions? And Mage is a game of dealing with unconventional solutions. It gives recommendations on pacing. It will likely come down to your cabal and what it chooses to do. Include quiet moments. The ending may ultimately be tragic. And it gives an interesting bit of advice where it says if you come up with an ending where things don't work out that is still interesting and rewarding from the characters, even if they don't don't win, you will be less inclined to fudge results to force a victory if bad means something cool. It recommends leaving some loose ends. It also brings up the idea of plot coupons, which is a term I hadn't encountered before, which is a character gets something just for showing up, where they're at a climactic battle between two forces, they kill off each other, and then they get a, an item required for the plot. Uh, they strongly recommend having ways to involve the characters in these and to include costs and complications that when you're dealing with a cataclysmic story, make use of cutscenes and facts and statistics to tell characters what a giant earthquake being unleashed kind of looks like. You may want to run side stories to wrap things up. And it also has a note that's like, by the way, if you're going to end the world, this is when you should flesh out your characters' families. And I'm like, uh, introducing a family strictly for the purpose of killing them all? I, I, <laughs> I think there are better ways to, to do that. Then it kind of has an aside on how to run very high powered mages and it suggests that masters likely have 10 successes running in running effects and arch masters have probably up to 20 and it makes the mention of towards the end you have vormos who is simultaneously pulling quintessence has a mind shield has some sort of physical shield and is trying to coordinate the the usage of the pasapata astra all at the same time and then it says remember there's a plus one to all magic per two effects that are running I don't remember this ever being stated before in Revised. I've heard people mention it before. This seems to be different than the domino effect, which was based on the number of effects that occurred within a scene. Adam, do you remember having seen this before? I have a yeah a vague memory of something in the uh, revised edition core book, but I'd have to go. Yeah, I wasn't able to track it down. So that that either felt new or was a different interpretation or something that is only mentioned in two places in revised. That seems like it should come up more. We also get systems for war, which is actually kind of neat where it gives kind of a rule for mass combat, where it breaks everything down into units, where it's like, hey, 500 untrained people is the equivalent of so many lightly trained, which is the equivalent of a crack team of 20. And it gives a system where you and an opposing thing would come up with an agenda and then pit units against each other to try and achieve an objective and how magic interfaces with that or uh, other supernatural powers. And I thought that was kind of cool. It really boiled things down differently. And then finally, it asked the question of, so what is ascension? What does it mean? And it gives a bunch of options. It could be some sort of escape from reality. Reality. It could be a form of salvation through a creator, which implies that there's a creator and the characters know what they want. And then finally, technological uh, singularity. And with that, that's the whole book. Listed my thoughts mostly as I go through. To me, of the End Times books, I've read this, Gehenna, and Time of Judgment. And I, I felt like this one was pretty satisfying. It gave a lot of options. It wrapped up a lot of threads. It gave you a bunch of interesting interpretations. Even if this book is not considered canon, reading through it helps explain some of the other bits that are left through revised. It gives you options to avoid disembodiment kind of out of nowhere, which you may find cheaty or not. It is generally well written. It is It varies very stylistically through chapters, which some people may be annoyed by and some people don't. I thought the art in general was pretty good. I thought it was evocative. The Lawrence McDougall art throughout, I, I very much enjoyed. On the whole, I thought this was a fitting end to a line. I could have asked for more, but uh, this is at least a solid B plus, A minus to me. What do you think, Adam? 
I think seven, uh, chapter seven had a lot of good material in it. It was a bit odd for me reading through it because it seemed like a lot of material in chapter seven was for supporting the five different stories before it. But then there was also a lot of material that was only supporting chapter two judgment. And so it's like you keep switching between, you know, this is for every story and this is for just that one canon story. So, I mean, that was a little, it wasn't jarring, but it, it does, did take some getting used to as I was moving through the chapter. Uh, let's see. Early on, there's a section called Timelines and Triggers, which gives advice on playing with the, with the meta plot and, uh, you know, different options you could try. And I, I found that to be of great value. I think that, that was a really good point to have there. Page 194 uh, helped me understand the revised edition meta plot. To be to be honest, it says that revised edition was written to end soon. It was basically they're saying, look, we put the Avatar Storm there with the intention that it would be something that rattled everybody, and after a, a couple of years, it would it would uh, grind down to a conclusion because it can't just go on that way which uh, helped me look at it. Because when I was reading through the first half of the revised edition books, I got this real impression that they were trying to say to the reader, yeah, the world's different now, and this is how it is, and it's going to keep going this way, and it's not so bad. And, and here on page uh, you know, 194 in chapter 7, it says, no, this was written to end soon. And, and that frame of reference helps me with the revised edition meta plot. It, it clicks better for me with that in mind. One thing that was very interesting for me was two different ways of looking at awakening that were brought into focus uh, for me. There's a section on the avatar shards and how they can awaken a sleeper. And basically, in early mage, awakening was tied to destiny, some kind of like higher significance. This, this means something. In the book Ascension, people awaken when they literally bump into an avatar. This is a very different take on things. So I would say for a storyteller considering starting your own chronicle, uh, one question to ask is, does a person's sleeping avatar awaken? And there's a lot of significance tied to that. Or does an avatar connect with a person and that awakens them? And there's no particular higher meaning. It's just a thing that happens. And it's interesting because it changes everything. The Holy Communion Rote is a big, you know, cosmic secret that the players get a hold of early in the uh, Judgment story, the, the canon story in Chapter 2. And here it gives some of the specifics on what abilities that the players will have after they have Holy Union cast upon them. And so for me, this helps me to look at the chapter two story a little differently. Uh, for example, there's a lot of uh, breaks in the story where there's a couple of months where nothing happens. And I think uh, it would be reasonable to have a story about the characters discovering what their Holy Union powers are, what they can do, and experimenting with those. And having those Holy Union powers uh, is going to affect some of the events in the second half of the Judgment story. So again, this is one of those parts where I would agree with Terry. It's like this this little chunk here, Holy Union and what it can do, just move that to chapter two because it, it helps me look at chapter two in a new way and uh, one that, that makes those breaks make a little more sense to me. Uh, the Rogue Council's untraceable messages was something that was brought uh, front and center in Rogue uh, manifesto transmissions of the Rogue Council. It's like, hey, the Sphinx can send messages to people that are just totally untraceable. Wow, what is going on here? We're not going to tell you. And so that was like a mystery hanging in the back of your mind for a large chunk of uh, Revised Edition. And so here it says, hey, according to canon material, that was Dante. He's an oracle. He can do things that um, the other, you know, uh, masters and below simply cannot do. And that explains why the messages were untraceable. And for me, that doesn't sound like a gimmick. That works. I, I can understand that. I hear that, that explanation. is like, yes, that makes sense. That respects previous mage material uh, that totally fits. And I think it's fun to hook in uh, Dante and kind of bring him into the story because the character appears on the cover of every edition of mage. So it's like to bring him into the end of the world story, that totally fits. That's something you should do. 
Uh, that that just sings to me. So yeah, a lot of fun there. And Rogue Council comes into focus for me in a way that that I like. Um, there are some suggestions for alternate Rogue Councils, ways you could do it totally differently that are not canon. And I actually like a number of the ideas. I, I thought that was that was fun. If if I'm going to work with the Rogue Council, I, I might actually be tempted to take one of those options there. So thumbs up on that one. Uh, page 210 gives us disaster rules. If you're going to have an earthquake, if you're going to have a nuclear meltdown, these are the two examples. Here's rules for it. And from that, I think I can extrapolate and and work out like a, a giant flood or you know tsunami tidal wave sort of a thing or, or other stuff like that so yeah i like those disaster rules and for an end of the world story yeah this it totally fits to put those rules into this book so that's a nice addition i'm, I'm marking that in my notes for if i might want to have a, a major citywide disaster happen in one of my own stories I'll, I'll thumb back to this now starting on page 212 we have a very interesting section called great enemies and defining magic uh, terry mentioned it but I, I just want to elaborate on that a bit it actually talks about how more powerful mages are going to have hanging effects they cast this rote yesterday but it's hanging in the air and it can be activated when they get attacked or when they're having a problem or just when they say the magic word and um, i'm not being flippant it really would work that way this helps us to see how for more powerful and capable and, and learned mages magical effects are not just i do it right now can i pull it off or not but there's, it, it's more of a chess match of I'm going to divide my resources between hanging effects and flexibility to do something on the fly because you can never really tell what's going to happen in the future. And so because there are some uh, minuses on their magic uh, that they do immediately based on how many effects they have hanging, this can be kind of a limiter for those uh, high erite super duper villains you see in different published mage books. It, it gives more of a justification for how your players' characters could handle a showdown with this strong character. And it also helps us to look at magic as more of a planning versus flexibility. Where do you want to be on that gradient rather than everything you do right now? How good are you at that? So I, I thought this was a very handy section. You know, I really wouldn't have minded if they had added a couple of paragraphs to that and moved it up to, um, say, say the overflow book for the, the core book that was at the beginning of revised edition. It would, it would have been nice, but at least we do get it. So I'm, I'm you know, not complaining. I'm just, just noting it's kind of odd to have it right at the end of things. But pages 213 through 216 give us group combat rules. I haven't tried them myself, but they look appealing. I, I like how they wrap things up quickly and allow you to make it sort of a, a tug of war between different factors that you're, you're keeping in mind. And so I, I think they're good, but I would have to play test them myself to really give a final word on these are good rules or, oh my gosh, what a mess. But, but they look good to me. And uh, again, I, I think they fit for end of the world scenarios because the way to help your player characters deal with an end of the world scenario is don't let them be helpless bystanders who are reacting to every new thing that they see breaking in the sky, but instead give them authority over others so that they are leaders, so that they are, are they have the resources then to take on the events of the end of the world. Hey, I'm going to send 100 guys over here. I'm going to send my 10 experts over here, and I'm going to do this one thing. And after two or three days of game time, I'm going to tell everybody to meet back, give me a status report, and then I'll plan what I'm going to do from here. It's like, yeah, that is a great way to handle an end of the world scenario. So that wraps up my chapter seven thoughts. Uh, there was an epilogue. Oh, yeah, we get a brief thing where Penny Dreadful is... About, out and about in the city of San Francisco and is contacted by Doc Eon that says, you need to do a thing. And Penny's like, you're Doc Eon. And Doc Eon's like, yup. <laughs> and then Penny's like, why are you telling me? And Doc Eon's is like, because you're a cool cat who's read my books. Also, Neville Sinclair would never listen to me in a million years. <laughs> and Penny is like, good point. I'm going to do the thing. How do you know it works? And Doc Ian's like, because it already did. And you're like, <laughs> oh. <laughs> so if, if Mage is going to have one final bit of fiction, something that brings together, what is it, Dante, Doc Eon, and Penny Dreadful, seems right. <laughs> so so yeah, that's that's the end. We're done revised, except for the four more books of revised we have to do. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
<laughs> yeah, so, I, th- I thought the epilogue was, was kind of fun how it wrapped it up. And I, I thought it was fun bringing the Penny Dreadful character in. She shows up in a number of editions and uh, has a number of different personalities to her. And so I, it was fun to bring her in. The only thing that was rough on me was Doc Eon says to her, quote, you've kept your feet where they belong. It's like, this is coming from the guy who's traveled like, <laughs> yeah. everywhere in the world and out of it. And he's telling somebody, no, you should stay home. So for me, it's like first edition Doc Eon says, it's time for adventure. And revised edition Doc Eon says, stay home. <laughs> so that, was, that was a bit of an oddity for me. But I love seeing Doc Eon show up. It actually describes his, char- his the clothes he's wearing. I, I haven't seen this place since 1957, so I'm a little behind. And Penny's like, yeah, you are a little behind, but it's cool to see you. And I was like, I was thinking, yes, it is cool to see you, Doc Eon. Thanks for showing up. Here at the end of all things, I'd like to see a friendly face. So generally speaking, I mean, the book as a whole, are you, you want to start off or should I no, share I, a few thoughts? I more or less gave my, my thoughts as a whole. So Adam, what did you think about the book overall? <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, for me, it was a bit of an oddity in the World of Darkness lineup because Mage never really had an end of the world narrative built into it. With uh, Vampire, it did. It had Gehenna. Vampires were saying to each other, at the end of all things, the Antediluvians, the, the third generation elder vampires, they're going to wake up and they're going to tear the place up. And what about that? And other vampires say, ah, I don't believe in that. And so there's something to really sink your teeth into at the end of Vampire. And with Werewolf, of course, it, they call it Werewolf the Apocalypse. And yeah, there is an apoc- apocalyptic notion hanging over the whole three editions of it, where they say, look, there's going to be a final battle. The worm is going to materialize. and We're all going to fight it to the death. And it's going to trash the world in the process. And who knows what's going to come out of that. It's like, okay, yeah, this is an end of the world scenario. And when... Werewolf is at its finish. You pick that up and you run with it because that's the only logical thing to do. With Mage, it was like, um, hey, what about the end of all Mage? And it's like, well, you know, Mages belonging to specific cultures have their own cultural traditions on the end of the world. But for the game, Mage as a whole, when all the Mages of different cultures get together, there's really nothing for the end of the world. So I don't know. What's central to Mage? Ascension. Well, what if Ascension was the end of the world? Okay, let's run with that. It's like, okay. I can understand why the writers said, look, we need a peg to hang our hat on when we're writing about the end of the world, so I guess we'll use Ascension. But for me, as a mage fan, it's like, Ascension is Armageddon? That's a new one. That that just came out of left field for me. It's like, I I guess I can sort of see how you could run with that ball, but uh, it's just a really new one to me. So that that phased me, I've got to say. This book assumes mass Ascension. A revised edition runs with the idea of mass ascension, which is easier to connect with the end of the world. The first two editions, uh, ascension is, is a personal thing. And so connecting that to the end of the world is just is just way out there. So I, I guess revised edition does make a, a little bit of sense with the mass ascension angle. Um, I think it was too bad that the Anakim are only portrayed as angels and um, you know traditional gray aliens, like with the, the gray skin and the giant black eyes. It gives those two possible views of Anakim, but that's all. It, it seems like yeah, it would have been more fun to just try a few more options, like add uh, two or three different ways to look at that, because I, I think there is more to work with. And it actually matters because when the Anakim show up in these end-of-the-world stories, the mage players, when you know, player characters, when they first see them, they see a human being, but then they sort of, on another level, they see flickers or glimpses of their true appearance. And so the storyteller is supposed to portray that to the players, and you're just given angels and greys. So yeah, this book really, you know, with the page count of this book, we could have added three different um, interpretations for Anakim to add to those first two, and it would have been very appropriate and very useful for storytellers. There is a continued reference to earlier mage books all through every chapter of this book, and while some people might be annoyed by that, hey, I don't have book X or books Y, for me... It is totally appropriate. I have no complaint at all. This book really was written for the mage fans who bought all the books before this. So I think it's letting the fans down if you don't constantly refer to the earlier books. So it's pretty graceful with saying, if you don't have this book, just this is the one sentence descriptor. So I thought it was even pretty graceful with that as opposed to other books where it's like, for any information whatsoever for this thing that we indicate is vital, you need the Sorcerer's Crusade book that doesn't actually contain the information you want. When they say, 
you know, you need this from, uh, for example, uh, Whimper Not a Bang about the aliens. It's like they pull in all this stuff from Fallen Tower Las Vegas, which was appropriate, a fit. And they said, and if you don't have it, you know, just wing it like this. It's like, okay, you're helping me out. You're, you're throwing me a bone. So I've got no complaints about this. I, I guess last off, uh, T- Terry and I were, were speaking about this one uh, detail before we recorded this episode. We were sending some emails back and forth, and I was saying, hey, it's kind of odd that when the Avatar Storm cut off the portals going to the Horizon Realms, the Horizon Realms apparently became lost. But it says in uh, Chapter 6, Hell on Earth, in the Fondi story, that um, all of the Horizon Realms still have their quintessence lines running to the nodes on Earth. And so I thought that was, was kind of jarring. It's like I didn't see any mention of this in earlier Mage books or for Revised Edition. Uh, it does not logically follow for me that the quintessence lines would remain linked. And And for me personally, that brings up actually introduces some problems because once the horizon realms are out of the picture and people are no longer going there and having communication with them, then the nodes that they are connected to on earth, they are much less defended. They are less supervised. And so a lot of those are going to change hands and uh, the new people are going to redirect the whatever quintessence lines are there to whatever they want. So that would definitely shake things up. And also from my approach to the prime sphere in every edition of mage, If you're standing at a node that is connected to a horizon realm or you're standing in the horizon realm that is connected to a node on Earth, it doesn't take a lot of knowledge in the prime sphere to be able to trace the quintessence line. And from there, to use spirit correspondence, one of the two, to travel between the two does not seem very difficult to me. So, you know, just from my point of view, if you want the horizon realms to be lost and totally cut off by the Avatar Storm, then it makes sense to me to cut the quintessence lines, because then you don't have all of those masters in uh, the horizon realm saying, well, I'm going to trace those quintessence lines and get home. Yeah, I'm going to get hurt, but you know, I don't want to be stuck here forever. That's not going to work. Uh, this, this realm is drifting off and it's probably going to break up. So I'm going home. I'm going to use my high level sphere magic to at least survive the, the, the rough trip home and, and get there by tracing the quintessence line. So that, that was my complaint. And then Terry had um, a reasonable, uh, a different point of view on that. And that was um, the portals, uh, being snapped by the Avatar Storm makes the whole meta plot of Revised Edition sing. But um, to you don't have to cut off the quintessence lines between nodes and horizon realms because it, it, it could be like um, an earthquake. The water from underground springs is just going to find a new way through and it's going to be there. But any tunnels taking a person from the surface down to specific places underground, those are just going to be trashed by an earthquake. So kiss those goodbye. So that is another way of looking at things. Yeah, they give you a bunch of examples of how to avoid disembodiment. And it also, to me, is more of a reminder that we haven't really gotten information on how realms work since Book of Chantries, on like how ley lines and quintessence and so on actually flow to realms and such. And it is one of those things where I would love a central reference for it, but they are presented in so many different ways. I don't think we could come up with something that wouldn't contradict at least half a dozen other things at this point. So my answer is usually vague (laughs) hand-waving. As opposed to Adam's read and consideration, you cheater. But well, yeah. I, I just think that with Prime, what, two or three, you can trace the, that quintessence line. Hey, I'm out of here. Yeah. But but yeah, that would kind of break the meta plot of Mage. And so, yeah, maybe maybe Adam and his complaints should just be locked in a closet somewhere <laughs> so everybody else can have a good time. Yeah, <laughs> we, we get vague in, in intimations that characters are, are constantly like hiding their resonance. But if they are, it feels like that should be more forward. So yeah, I, I totally, I totally get it. It just goes in one of the things where I generally hand wave around it. But I think the let's trace ley lines back to their source and use that as a way to uncover information is something that can be very front and forward and interesting in, in a mage game. One thing I was uh, noticing was there are a, a couple of places, a couple of different stories in this book, Ascension, where they say, "Hey, this Horizon Realm is still around," and I, that really wasn't a complaint for me because I do remember a passage in uh, Infinite Tapestry where it said, look, the Horizon Realms are gone. That, that is the setting of Revised Edition. But if you're running an interesting story and you have some particular reason for having one or two uh, of these Horizon Realms still around so your players can go there, then you know, go for it. Use a plot element. It's your story. Have some fun. And you know, there's probably one or two that accidentally are still lying around. So run with it. So when I got to Ascension and they said, hey, Balador is still there or um, Horizon Chantry Realm is, is still there. It's like, yeah, you know, Infinite Tapestry said keep one or two if you've got a story built around it. So th- this is not a complaint. 
I guess with that, you want to take us out, Adam? Or Sure. If you have something to say, please contact us at magethepodcast at gmail.com. Please send us your questions, comments, feedback, anything you'd like to tell us. We'd like to listen. Subscribe to Mage the Podcast on iTunes, Google Play, TuneIn, and other aggregators. If you like the show, others might like it too. And if you leave a review for Mage the Podcast, it makes us more visible in other people's searches. We would definitely appreciate it. You can follow us on Twitter at Mage the Podcast. We're also on the web at magethepodcast.com. You can listen to past episodes there, see the complete show notes that we prepare for you. And this episode is thanks to executive producers Alexander Gordon, Anders S., Andrew Edelstein, Andy, Berto, Boogers, 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 Brendan Morrill, Bryce Perry, Chris Sack, Dan Svensson, Dennis Osborne, Entropy Prime, Freddie, Gabrielle Pelotaro, uh, Garga Lenoir, Guy Conan Stewart, Ian, Isabel Castillo, Jason Kennedy, Jason W. Biggs, Jay Sunsern, Jenna F., John Horton, John Magnuson, Josh Golden, Josh Hillerup, Josh Heath, Carl Halperin, Leslie Weatherstone, Michael Credle, Michael Parker, Nabero, Neil Patterson, Nikita Klimanov, uh, Ralph Schunhammer, uh, Richard Bat Brewster, Ryan Hilton, Ryan Kendi, Samuel Tobin, Stephen Carton, William Connolly, William Martin, W. Starter, uh, Christopher Phillips, who is at an Oracle level, and Buck Farmer, also at an Oracle level. We appreciate those. If you would like to become an executive producer for Major Podcast, it would help us to keep bringing you episodes like this one. You would also become a part of our own council to discuss upcoming projects. The link in the show notes will get you started. Well, thanks, everyone, for listening. And until next time, and yes, there will be a next time, we're not quite done with the Books of Mage. Truth and Tell Paradox, baby. Remember, if you've only got one chapter to explain how everything works, make every sentence count, and even the sentence you exclude, make those count too. Bye!